Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. This week we are joined by political consultant extraordinaire and one of our all-time favorites, Paul Bagala. Remember, we take your questions each episode, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can and don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check out the links to this week's sponsor, Blinkist, in the show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. James, we'll have a lot to talk about today, but let me start with um, something uh, different. John Gruden was cashiered as coach of the Las Vegas Raiders professional football team after disclosures that he sent racist, homophobic, and misogynist messages. This wasn't an isolated incident. Gruden is a vile bigot. That's all you can say. But, you know, the bigger scandal here, James, is that much of the expose came from the NFL's investigation of the toxic culture of the Washington football team. Gruden exchanged some offensive emails with some of their executives, which were then leaked to the New York Times. Yet, that report was never released, a report about the Washington football team. It was covered up. And after a mild slap on the wrist, Dan Snyder, the owner, remains in charge. As the lawyers for some of the women who were sexually attacked uh, by people in this franchise wrote, and I'm going to quote it because it really is a great statement, it is truly outrageous that after the NFL's 10-month investigation involving hundreds of witnesses and 650,000 documents related to the longtime culture of harassment and abuse at the Washington football team, the only person to be held accountable and lose their job is the coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. James, this is outrageous. And through public pressure, investigative reporting, and lawsuits, we need to find out everything that was in that report, investigation, that report, what the NFL is covering up and trying to hide and whether Dan Steiner is fit to remain his owner. Well, no, the NFL did take decisive action. They said he couldn't be the president of the team, so his wife. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. That, you're, you're right. That, that, that's the kind of stuff <laughs> you expect out of yeah. Park Avenue. That, that kind of decisive, you know, this will not stand. Now, of course, the reason— Out of that, Roger Goodell. Right. Yeah, the, and of course, the, the and I want people that actually like Roger, but the reason that it was leaked is that he basically called Roger Goodell a, a, a homosexual. And so they leaked that part on Gruden because, you know, it goes to show you, you be, be careful when you talk about the commission. What, what people are interested in, what's the other 649,499 email show? Yeah. All right? Yeah. And so well, I, I don't know. Why didn't they release and, it? And why did his plans? I, 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 I don't know. I'd, I'd like to ask the lawyer, but... These plaintiff lawyers are going to try to, they're representing 13 women that worked for, which was then the Redskins, which is now the Washington football team. Uh, there might be evidence in there that buttresses their case. Well, we'll have to ask our legal consultants, Walter Dellinger and Seth Waxman, uh, but you as a lawyer, James, it strikes me that once they start leaking parts of that investigation, that they lose their privilege uh, to hide the rest of it. Uh, at least, I, at least it's yeah, a, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a little rusty on the rules of civil procedure, but it sure seems to me like, you know, in discovery of which should be optimized. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they put it behind the attorney-client privilege. So it's a law firm that does it, and this this is a great scam. This is what the scam of Ken Starr and Baylor, you know, they had the the. Pepper Hamilton report, but they couldn't release it because they had it, it was legally thing, and so then people would say what was in it was all bullshit, what they were saying. And there's got to be a, you know, when somebody says we're going to have a law firm look into this, the, the only person that sees it is the client. The NFL or, or, or the Baylor University, I would argue, is a, like a public entity almost. They, they rely on public faith and public goodwill, but. We'll see. That's just the way to cover this shit up. Well, of course, that, that lawyer reported to the National Football League, whose commissioner is hired uh, by the owners uh, of the National Correct. Football League. And uh, however much some of the other owners don't much like Dan Snyder, they bond together when there's any threat uh, to take action against one of them. Uh, so and to, and Remember this. Under the tutelage of Roger Goodell, they've made money hand over foot. And that's what they care about. Okay. 
Well, of course it is. Right. But, but say, that it makes right. no difference in the baseball owners or the women's soccer league or the WNBA, anything else. Well, when I read that comment from that, um, uh, well, yeah, it's no different, except this was a public case. This was a case of, of a toxic culture. This was a case that the NFL says they find unacceptable. If they really do find it unacceptable, all they have to do is release it. That great <laughs> comment from the lawyers today. Remember, that was great. Remember the great Jerry Tarkanian observation, <laughs> the old rascal UNLV coach who said the NCAA is so mad at Kentucky, they put Cleveland State on, on probation. Right. Uh, and that's what I mean. <laughs> the only the only person to suffer from that that long, lengthy investigation of the Washington football team was the Las Vegas coach. Honest to God. God, that guy, I mean, he he, he, he was commenting on everything, wasn't he? He had a lot oh. of opinions. I, I, I just wonder how many of the NFL coaches called him and said, well, you didn't say anything wrong, John. I mean, yeah. that's a culture of football. Yeah. You know, that's just, that's just what it is. I mean, that's the culture they live in, I'm sure, but it's improved somewhat, but... Who knows? Yeah, you know? and I think there's probably more than a handful, but there are also some who don't uh, do that. I don't think our old friend North Turner uh, would have done that, and I think there are others. Uh, Vince Lombardi wouldn't have done that. No. I mean, and, I'm not uh, saying so, they but, are, but, I've no, but you're right. It is the culture. You know, Nick Saban never do anything like that. Right. He never, you know, say Saban, Saban I mean, that kind of shit. Right, right. But the, uh, but but the, it, but the macho probably. guys, and John Gruden, who actually was a, was, was a very good football coach. He won a Super Bowl. But, you know, just an awful person and a really insecure no. person. I oh, mean, when and, you and read that, that he, was a good, and he was a good commentator. Yeah, yeah. He was the highest paid commentator they had. Yeah. And, you know, it, it got $100 million. Of course, it got fired for cause. I mean, this, this is costing him a lot of money. And, you know, he'll never be back on TV. And he'll never be you back know, coaching. A, I, I saw one tweet coaching. that said, man, you know, he's the lead candidate for the USC job. In your dreams. There ain't no, I mean, this, you talk about toxic. John Gruden is toxic, as no. he should be. USC couldn't, the USC's got enough problems. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, okay, uh, investigative reporters, lawsuits, uh, public pressure, keep it on the NFL. We need to find out what was in that Washington football team report. Absolutely. Unfortunately, they're going to fight like hell to see that you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, with the fall weather coming, there's nothing better than a great book. But if you're like us, you want to learn as much as you can, and that's why we recommend Blinkist. Blinkist takes top nonfiction books and gives you the key takeaways in text and audio explainers called Blinks that you can digest in just 15 minutes. You can use Blinks to tackle procrastination, get started on developing an idea or business, take your projects to the next level, or plunge into history with titles like The Soul of America and the Future of Capitalism by Paul Collier. They blink thousands of titles in 27 categories. And if you like podcasts, and I know you all do, they blink those too with Shortcast. And it's all in one app right in your pocket so you can learn anytime, anywhere with Blinkist. Taylor made for us old guys, James, and young guys too, and young women. I'd like to know who they get to do this because I mean, it's utterly brilliant. And I mean, they just extract the entire thesis of a book and give it to you in a in a very short way that you can really understand. I mean, it, it it's, it's stunning that they, that can do this on this kind of scale and with this kind of quality. It, 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 it's quite an achievement. Yeah, it sure is. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash War Room to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off of a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash War Room to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash War Room or look for the link in our show notes. Hey, James, perhaps you have heard of today's guest, political guru Paul Begala, the proud son of the Lone Star State and a forever Longhorn. Paul, welcome, and I'll make a deal with you. I won't mention the Red River Showdown oh. if you, if you will, will tell me why what I'm about to say 
is wrong about your state. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, terrible job on COVID. He's a vote suppressor. He wants to overturn Roe v. Wade. Your lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, last year suggested maybe some old geezers should die to get the economy coming back. And your attorney general, Ken Paxton, is under indictment and under federal investigation for something else. And yet all three right now are favored to win re-election. How can that be? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a heartbreak. Not as big a heartbreak as the Texas-Oklahoma game, I will say. Uh, uh, Texas was unranked. Oklahoma was highly ranked. We should have beat them. We had them up. Uh, we had Texas that was up uh, 14 points in the first two minutes. Uh, I will say one thing. The one thing that took some of the sting out of it is that true freshman quarterback for Oklahoma, Caleb Williams, is a graduate of Gonzaga High School in Washington, D.C., where he was a friend with my son, Patrick. And so to see your 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 son's buddy carve you up like that is the ultimate. That made up for that. That made up for those final 15 seconds. Oh, no, nothing could. Nothing could, but I was right, tell us why Texas kid, is in such, he's, he's a terrific Tell us kid, why eh? Texas is in such sorry shape. Well, it, because it's been a one-party state for 27 years. They, they, they elect everybody in Texas. You know, they, they elect the agriculture commissioner, the railroad commissioners. So there have been over 200 statewide elections in the last 27 years. Republicans have won every single one of them, every single one. And um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Republican Party in Texas – has uh, gone off a cliff. And, uh, you know, Democrats have to right the ship. They have to. And they've been trying. They've gotten close a couple of times. Uh, Beto O'Rourke, most notably in 2018, almost beat Ted Cruz, but he didn't. He lost. And, uh, you know, it's just it's, it really is a question of whether you get the government you deserve. You know, p- people in Texas, I, I have always said Texas is not a red state so much as it's a non-voting state. We are always at the bottom uh, in voting. Uh, O'Rourke and some others helped to begin to turn that around, but the Democrats have to do a lot more and a lot better. Um, do you think it's, it's too soon in 2022 to beat any of those guys? It's tough. It's very tough. Yeah. You know, yeah. as happens in one party states, though, the, the, the incumbents are getting challenged from within their own party. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Greg Abbott has two opponents from the right. He's not conservative enough. He's not crazy. It's a conservative is the wrong word because it's not at all conservative. He's not uh, right wing enough. He's not crazy enough for a few of these activists. And, and, and I just I want to highlight one thing that you actually left out of the indictment of Abbott, which it might be the worst. This week, he removed the uh, uh, promotion for the Trevor Project and other suicide prevention programs from a state website. Um as you know, uh, suicide rates among teens are frighteningly high, but uh, suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts among LGBTQ plus teens is through the roof. Um, it, it is heartbreaking. And so, of course, the, the state of Texas uh, Department of Families and Children's Services has on their website a little bug attaching to both the suicide prevention hotline and the Trevor Project, which is particularly targeted at LGBTQ youth. One of Abbott's ultra right wing opponents attacked him for that. And within 24 hours, he ordered that scrubbed off the website. Uh, it, it, this is at a time when, uh, according to the Trevor Project, calls to their site are up 150 percent in Texas because trans kids are being attacked by the right wing Republicans in Texas. Um, so if I can put in a plug, if anybody knows or loves someone who they think is thinking about harming themselves, talking about suicide, it may be, God forbid, attempting. The Trevor Project, the number, which is no longer on the state of Texas website, the number is 1-866-488-7386. Repeat that, Paul. Yep. 1-866-488-7386. Or, even easier, text the word START to 678-678. START. To 678-678. This should never be a political issue. Saving our, our daughters and sons, saving our nieces and nephews, saving our brothers and sisters uh, at a time when they're the most vulnerable people. What kind of a man does that? What kind of a leader does that? Well, Paul, uh, of course it shouldn't be. And I suspect even in rather conservative Texas, that's not popular. I know I've seen polls that, that what Abbott has done on COVID is not popular. Overturning Roe v. Wade is not popular, but I come back to not just Texas, but elsewhere. They don't pay a price. Right. Why? Well, they do a, a terrific job of distraction through division. 
Greg Abbott couldn't keep the lights on. We had a terrible winter storm in February, but Oklahoma kept the lights on and Texas couldn't. Oklahoma. The only reason Texas doesn't float off in the Gulf of Mexico is because Oklahoma sucks. And yet colder in Oklahoma, it is north of Texas. They kept the lights on. Greg Abbott could not do so. I have a friend whose aunt froze to death. 700 Texans froze to death. So he couldn't keep the lights on. He can't keep COVID down. He can't hardly keep the ICUs open. So what does he do instead of solving those hard problems? He distracts. He uses division for distraction. He attacks vulnerable kids because they're LGBTQ+. He, He attacks women and their right to exercise their constitutional right to choose to have an abortion. Um, He he uses division for distraction, and sure enough, it works. We've stopped talking about the fact that 700 Texans froze to death because Greg Abbott didn't do his job. You know, we don't talk about the fact that Texas, with 10 million fewer people than California, has nearly as many COVID deaths, essentially the same. I think they're about 1,000 or 2,000. And a much higher rate, a much Much higher higher rate. rate. Both, Much both, both, rate. both incidents and deaths. Paul, um, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's a long. Let me ask you one more question, then you can get acquainted with our, uh, our co-host. Uh, <laughs> I've wanted to Cardo. meet him. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be good. Um, but the other, you know, the Latino vote last year in Texas, fastest growing population in Texas, real disappointment for Democrats. Not only did Republicans, but Trump made inroads. What are Democrats doing about it? What should they be doing about that? Well, I'm actually going down there tomorrow, and I'll know better in person. But what they need to do is, you know, the social workers always say you got to meet people where they live. Don't try to impose on them some um, um, rubric that you bring into the conversation. This is what I mean by that. We talked about this, Albert, uh, on this podcast the morning after the election, and I made a fool of myself. I made an ass of myself. I saw the collapse among Democrats in the Rio Grande Valley. And, you know, I was sleep deprived and and emotional. I thought maybe the thing had been rigged because the Democrats lost 50 points. Counties that Hillary carried by a margin of 50, 52, 55 were even or one county, Zapata County, Joe lost. And you usually don't see a swing like that without some kind of, 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 of monkey business. There was none. I was wrong. I was being hysterical and stupid. What happened? I looked into this. I spent some time on this. I, I did three things. I called Billy Begala, which is this podcast special correspondent for Texas, my yes. son, who worked in the Democratic uh, Senate campaign down there. I called Carl Rove, who knows a thing or two about uh, politics in Texas. And I got the University of Texas to do a, a focus group for me, just gather a bunch of current and former students from UT Rio Grande Valley. Not representative, very highly educated, really bright and much younger than, than most, but all three clustered around a set of issues. What voters in the Rio Grande Valley, Mexican-Americans mostly, and the most Democratic area in Texas, what they were told is that Democrats wanted to ban fracking, uh, defund the police, uh, disrespect the military, uh, cut or close ICE and the Customs and Border Patrol. And, you know, that's the poorest place in America. It's poorer than Appalachia. It's poorer than any uh, neighborhood in any city in the north. The Rio Grande Valley is the poorest place in Texas. My roommate in college was from there. Still is. He's a lawyer down there. And and there's only a couple of ways out of that poverty. Work in fracking, work for the Customs and Border Patrol, work for the county sheriff, join the military. And they were told, unanswered, right, unresponded. They were told the Democrats were against all that. Now, I can litigate that. But if you allow your opponent to define yourself that way, that's a disaster. Worse some of the Democrats' allies defined them that way. If you were watching the presidential primaries, you saw candidate after candidate saying they wanted to end fracking, which would put tons of those people out of work. Biden was not one of them. That's why Biden won. But, you know, I got to do a lot of explaining to get that message across. So some of this was uh, I, what the soccer fans call an own goal, you know, where Democrats uh, pushed away voters in the Rio Grande Valley and and Republicans uh, uh, did a very effective job of character caricaturing the Democrats message. Paul Begala, I want you to meet James Carter. <laughs> so, and Paul, I'm going to ask an unusually long question because I want to invite an unusually long answer because this is something that I've been thinking about. So we, we were together since I think Labor Day of 1981. 
Wow. And it was doctrine that Democrats had to do hard things. God damn it, you got to do something about these entitlements, okay? Don't pander to the middle class. Remember in 1993 when we were doing a plan, we had to have a five-cent tax on gasoline because well, you're not serious without that. And that was an article, as Paul Krugman has pointed out, to be against entitlement reform was to be for segregation. <laughs> it was, there, it was a, a thousand percent consensus, all right? And you had to do tough things. So now, fast forward, we're in 2021. We're asking Democrats to do overwhelmingly popular things like raise taxes on the rich, 70 percent, negotiate prescription drug prices, 70 percent, all right? Codify Roe v. Wade, 70 percent. All right, we're not, no one is asking anybody for an iota of political courage yet. We're saying, do the popular thing. And we can't even do that. This is, this is not, you're not walking the plank. Nobody, not even, no, the, even the Washington Post editorial page is not calling for cutting Social Security and Medicare. They don't even talk about it at Washington cocktail parties anymore. All right, so... How do, you, how do you, how do you, what do you say to our caucus? Because my theory is, I'm not, no one's asking you to do any this hard shit. We're asking you to do easy stuff. Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, and you and I were part of the Clinton team that did ask people to do hard things, like that tiny little gas tax increase, other uh, cuts in some uh, programs. In fact, we raised taxes on Social Security for upper income uh, retirees. Uh, and it, it worked and the economy prospered. You're right. There's, there is nothing in the Build Back Better agenda that is particularly politically courageous or difficult, if you ask me. Uh, and I, I'm a quibble a little bit because I looked this up. Medicare prescription drug negotiation, lowering the price of prescription drugs for Medicare by using market forces, buying in bulk in just the ways that Sam's Club or Costco does. It's got 88 percent support. Oh, I'm sorry. James. Okay, 88. I'll, I'll nine correctly. out of 10. Nine out of 10 Americans can't agree on anything. Nothing. And yet they nine out of 10 Americans agree that that's what we should be doing. So I am vexed. Uh, if, I, if I want to add to that. The consequences of failure are not just like with Clinton that, well, Bob Dole beats you and Bob Dole becomes president or 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 like with Obama. Mitt Romney beats you and Mitt Romney becomes president. The wolf is at the door. If the Democrats can't get their act together, this could be the last act for American democracy. And I, you know me. All my, all, all my adult life, James, I am not a hysteric. I'm not overwrought. I try to be very sort of moderate. Uh, I, but I've, I've really thought about this and dug into it. And I've talked to moderates on the Hill and leftists on the Hill. And I've got a new column. I rarely like so shamelessly plug my own work. But I've got a new column on CNN.com opinion. Uh, and I'm proud to say uh, my friends in the White House like it. My friends in the far left of the Democratic House like it. And my moderate friends in the House like it. Now, maybe they're just being nice to me. But I'm making the argument that like like Apollo 13, failure is not an option. If the Democrats fail, in addition to not being able to help lift children out of poverty or help seniors retire in dignity or help families raise their kids, uh, in addition to that, the insurrectionists will take over. I mean it. It is more likely than not, as we sit here, that Republicans take the House. It is more likely than not that Trump seeks his party's nomination. It is more likely than not that if he does, he will win that nomination. And then it's a coin toss. It's a jump ball whether Donald Trump comes back into, into the White House with an insurrectionist majority in the House. So he might not even have to get more votes or even more electoral votes if they rig the House. The House counts the electoral votes, as we all know now. So uh, it is catastrophic. It is existential. And the notion that my Democrats and yours, James, are arguing over the timing of voting for the infrastructure bill first or arguing that we should preserve the filibuster, which is simply uh, 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 historically a tool of racism. The fact that we're arguing about nonsense like that when the entire democracy is at risk is really appalling. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I'm, I can't wait to read your piece. I hope everybody on the, listens to this podcast. I, well, these people are going to read your piece. I mean, even if you are known that, they'll read every word that you say. And, you know, we are asking people, we're asking people to do popular things. That should, shouldn't be that, that hard. I will make a prediction right now. It, when in 2024, 
Donald J. Trump will be in a penitentiary. He's wow. not going to run for president. He's going to be in jail because the Manhattan DA is going to indict him and he's going to convict him. And the only the only way that they don't is that he's not a criminal. If you believe, as I do, that Trump is a, is a career criminal that commits <laughs> crimes, he's going to get caught. This is not some Robert Mueller half-ass operation here. These people are serious as a heartbeat. Serious as a heartbeat. And Mr. Pomeranz and FSIS, they're not wasting time here. So that, that is my well, mega prediction. He will be in the penitentiary. I have no idea. I really don't. And I, I don't have any that, inside that information. Right. But. All right. But here's the thing. Even if Trump, let's just say he decides to spend more time on his on his golf game and decides to get out of politics. Trumpism persists. Trumpism dominates one of the great parties. We are watching in Ohio, Ohio, (laughs) the the, the cradle of the Republican Party. Right, right. The, the home of Ulysses Grant. Bob Taft. <laughs> Robert Wait, Taft. Who's the, Sherman. Who's, who's the Trumpist? Who is I, the most right. Trump? Right. Oh, Vandell. Who's the most insurrectionist? Oh, I'll tell you, J.D. Vance no, won't they see don't, that. They don't, I, uh, all my uh, friends in uh, Ohio say the right wing is up. J.D. is a convert. Mandel's there from the uh, beginning, and he's nuttier than you can be. Can you can well, imagine? He's whorish than you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so even if. Mr. Trump goes uh, and practices his golf game. Trumpism is not dead or disgraced. In fact, this is the weird thing. Uh, uh, James, you know this. I, I took the boys. We went on a wilderness trip in the most remote place we could find in the lower 48, in the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness of Montana. The, no, nothing is allowed in there that has wheels or a motor. I mean, you have to live like the original mountain men or the Native Americans. And we did for a week. It was great. Freezing cold, slept in tents. I came back from that with no, you know, no cell service, no nothing, no radio, nothing. And I came back and, you know, you see things sometimes more clearly. And I watch these two parties and they each have their disputes. The Democratic Party's dispute is about tech techniques and tactics and timing. You know, it's pretty normal. It's like if you just parachute in from the wilderness and you see the Democrats are arguing about how much to spend on grandma's uh, dental care. You're like, oh, that's the Democrats. The Republic, and by the way, it's a pretty, it looks like the progressives are kind of winning, but a pretty even fight, maybe 60-40. Look at the Republicans. Their fight is about whether we will continue as a democracy, and it's a rout. God bless Liz Cheney, with whom I agree on no issues. She shows courage. She actually wants to enact a conservative agenda through the Constitution. <laughs> Imagine that. And a few others, Adam Kinzinger, a very few others, but it's a 90-10 to 10 rout for the insurrectionists uh, in their party. And it's not, it's very tempting now that I'm in the media to say, well, both sides have their problems, Al. Both sides have their disputes. Both sides have their extremists. No, uh, like I don't agree with Bernie Sanders and AOC on the issues, but at the end of the day, they kind of just want more health care more quickly, more costly than I do. That's all. Yeah. They don't want to end so, American so, democracy. Yeah, wait, for, first of all, they're not winning. But they, they, um, Joe Biden, that yeah, the best of the progressive movement ran. He got sixty-five percent. Well, look yes. at New York City; they can't win in New York City. They're twenty percent of our party, and you're right. Or, or, they, or, or think, New Orleans, or in Cleveland. Yeah, or your, or, yeah, or his. But I, I, I think that AOC, to some extent, Bernie Sanders, are, are have policy prescriptions that are, are not practical, not and, and to somewhat slightly naive. All right, that's the worst you can say. That's twenty percent of the Democratic Party. 80% of their party is out of their goddamn minds. <laughs> don't even support. And so, right. of course, but both, you know, David, David, David Broder, David Broder, middle of the road, okay? That <laughs> culture that permeates out. And right. you hear this all the time. Well, you know, I'm just tired of the crazies in both parties. I, you know, I like something. Uh-huh. No, we, we have some naive, impractical people. They have people that are, are, out of their fucking minds. I mean, totally. And it's just not the same thing. And I, I, I want to start a foundation, a, a NGO in Washington, you know, for to, to just point out, have media matters point out how, how stupid this both side argument is. But you make a good point. But they're not. The Democrats have time and time again. The you know, I have look. I, I have a lot of things in common with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. 85% right. of the stuff they want, we all want, but they right. don't win elections. 
Well, that's what I mean. They don't, but they, they're, I think, they're getting a hell of a deal on the policy front. Right. If you, if you went back in time, a mere five years, I don't know if you remember this, but my friend Hillary Clinton ran for president. Hillary proposed in 2016, five years ago, the largest investment in infrastructure since the federal highway system was created. It was $275 billion. And when she proposed, I thought, gee whiz, that's a lot of money. But you know, Hillary, it was costed out perfectly and paid for. And, you know, $275 billion was the high water mark five years ago. We're gonna, we got 19 Republicans in the Senate, even, to vote for $1.2 trillion. If you add all this together, if you add the American Rescue Plan, which is already passed and helping a lot of people, add that, that's $1.8 trillion. Add that to the $1.2 trillion infrastructure, which I think will pass. Add that to call it a $2 trillion compromise uh, Build Back Better plan on the, on the social safety net. That's $5 trillion. The entire American economy in 1987, the entire GDP was $5 trillion. A little less is 4.8. So we're talking about an expenditure of federal money equal to the entire economy when Ronald Reagan was president. And the progressives, some of them are whining about it. It's like, guys, take the win. <laughs> take the win. But, 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 but what about the but, but, but what about the emails? <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget the emails. I mean, goddamn. How many stories in New York Times still on the fucking emails? Yeah. Well, anyway. uh, according to the uh, Barone Center at Harvard, uh, the right. George, John Shorenstein Center, more stories about her emails than all of Trump's problems combined. Okay, we're not going to relitigate uh, 2016. No, we're we're gonna, we're, we're, we, we got enough current Hillary's problems. Book, Paul, got a new Paul let, me, let, me, let me ask you mm-hmm. the, the, the rap, which I think is highly unfair, but it's, it's out there anyway. That Biden ran as a moderate and is governing as a lefty. That's what the Republicans say. Tell us why that's bullshit. Yeah, I think he's moderate in temperament and progressive in agenda. But and, aren't those uh, the same issues he ran on in 2020? Yes, of course. It is. That's the thing. It's a bit of a false uh, argument. As I say, James and I from the Clinton wing of the party agree with Bernie and AOC about probably 85 percent of this. It's about timing and it's about uh, scope and it's, you know, but – we're largely in agreement, but Biden ran on that stuff. And, and if you, this is the problem as the sausage is being made, the only thing anybody talks about is the price tag. They don't, they they don't do a good enough job of connecting that up. I mean, the white house deserves, the white house deserves some blame for that. Well, they do. In addition, what I'm concerned about is that they have lost the thread of the threat Right. That's why I came back from vacation and wrote this piece about the end of democracy. Biden, when he was uh, Obama's vice president, had this great line. They were running for re-election 2012. He said, don't compare us to the almighty, compare us to the alternative. Well, Biden has lost the alternative. Right. There's not apparently a single Republican in the House who will vote for child care. There's apparently not a single Republican in the House or maybe even in the Senate, apparently, who will vote for dental and vision and hearing care under Medicare. There's not a single Republican in the House who's going to vote for uh, clean energy, for any of the things in the in the Biden agenda. And I think he needs to reintroduce that threat. He needs to remind people that this is a choice. And one party supports this massive relief package for the middle class, and the other party opposes it and, frankly, the Constitution as well. And he's left that other side out. He really has. You go back and you look at how Ronald Reagan pummeled Jimmy Carter <laughs> for eight years. You look at how FDR never quit attacking Hoover. You know, Martin it's, Burton and Fish. <laughs> right. I Successful didn't, I didn't, president. I didn't, I didn't, draw the I didn't cover that, Paul, but uh, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you read um, David Shore's analysis yeah. of rather bleak analysis of what the Democrats have gotten wrong and the threats ahead. Uh, what did you think of it? Yeah, I think there's a lot to it. I, I think, first off, what a radical notion that we should run on things that people like. Right. You know, um, James remembers, he just referred to it, that there was a whole cadre of Democrats who were just jumping up and down to cut Social Security and Medicare uh, back in the 90s. And Clinton fought them off, and that's how he won the nomination against Paul Saugus. And, and as president, he saved Social Security. You remember that famous speech. Um, so it's a radical notion. That Democrats support things that people are for, and so maybe they should run on that. But I think at the heart of it is this. 
It's a conversation I had with Clinton in 91. He was just beginning his campaign. And I suggested that we should study Lee Atwater, the divisive but brilliant strategist who'd put George H.W. Bush in the White House. He, he's, he was dead by then. But Atwater had these wedge issues. He knew that the Democrats had a multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious coalition. And so he wanted wedges and he called them wedge issues, uh, mostly dividing us on race, but also on gay rights, women's rights, civil rights. And I suggested maybe we should look for wedges in the Republican coalition. And Governor Clinton, he took those those big hands and those long fingers and he stitched them together. And he said, no, Polly, we don't need wedge issues. We need web issues. The only hope for our party and our country is if we stitch people back together across those lines. And uh, that was his entire political philosophy, and it remains mine today. And so we need to find things that stitch us all back together. Case in point, one of Carvel's favorite issues, and I've become a, 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 a disciple of, Cory Booker's baby bonds. This is a brilliant idea. It's Social Security for babies. When your baby is born, she gets a $1,000 account set up. If you are a, a medium to low income, we add $2,000 to it every year. By the time she turns 18, it's worth $46,000. And it's not, it's not enough, but New York City now is giving 100 bucks to every kid who enters enter kindergarten. Same principle. And just uh, and, build on it. And if it grows over time, here's the thing. It will lift millions of people out of poverty, but it will create generational wealth, which is lacking in the black community. Right now, an 18-year-old white kid is worth 16 times more than an 18-year-old black kid. That is a racial wealth disparity that you cannot overcome. And just, most people cannot. And just, well, just I want to turn it back to James, but I think you take well, David Shore and Booker's, you marry it, and you marry David Shore to Stacey, what Stacey Abrams does, oh, and maybe you, yeah. have a, maybe you have a winning formula. Go ahead, James. So, I want to go back. So, Ezra Klein does a piece in the New York Times on David Shore. And David right. Shore is one of the brightest bulbs in the party. And the headline is like nuts. It says, David Shaw has news, bad news the Democrats don't want to hear. I don't know how to tell you this, New York Times. The Democrats <laughs> love to hear bad news. My God. <laughs> this is one thing that we don't, that I, you go to anywhere, they go, they, they want bad news. I'm sorry. And then the, the last paragraph says that Shaw thinks that the Democrats should poll issues and find out what is popular and run on that. Thank God we never thought of that back in our day. Thank God we never went to Stan Greenberg or Jeff Guerin and said, let's try these things and see which one works the best because you can only get this kind of illumination all right, and be this brilliant if you're not tainted with, you know, with cutting Social Security or Medicare. But... At any rate, man, it was great to have you on the show. And just to reiterate that figure, more on the emails than every problem that Trump had from Harvard <laughs> University of all places. <laughs> Hook them horns, right. guys. Hook them horns. Go Tigers. Well, Beat Oklahoma State. You, hey, I'll Paul, be there. Paul, who do you play this week? Oklahoma State. I will be there. Right. Uh, I still have season tickets. I only live 1,200 miles away. Why would, I give, why would I give them up? I will be sitting with Billy Begala on the 47-yard line. Watching yeah. Texas beat the godless cowboys of Oklahoma State. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you have you you have difficulty with my well, wife's uh, what first, was worse? first state. I'm losing, not sure. Huh? Losing to Oklahoma or oh. Texas A and M beating Alabama. <laughs> oh, that's right. First time in my life I rooted for Alabama. <laughs> and they disappointed. All right, have fun this weekend, Paul Bagala. You've been a All great right, guest as always. Thank, Thank you, man. You. Okay. Right. See ya. Terrific. Okay, James, now our favorite segment, the questions and answers, the very good questions from our listeners. James, I have a complaint about one of our producers, Dan Max. I really do. He's sending in so damn many good questions, it's awful hard to pick which ones <laughs> we're, we're going to do. But yeah. this is See, a problem. <clears throat> we've got a great global reach today. And I want to start off to you with Tina from Sydney, Australia. Tina asks, She's curious to know what you think of the relatively recent epiphanies which struck Liz Cheney and Chris Christie. Is there a price they need to pay for their support and enabling of Trump, his corruption and desecration of the presidency during his reign? Or given the existential threat currently faced by your democracy, should they be forgiven and supported? 
Well, first of all, I, I don't know that Liz has ever really embraced Trump that hard because she's, you know, dying to war conservative. And Christie, you know, remember he ran for president and he endorsed Trump and they kind of were kind of friends. And, uh, you know, if you don't reward people from breaking off, no, I, 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 I understand where a friend from uh, down under is coming from. But, you know, this church takes converts. The anti-Trump church, we take converts. Well, James, I actually, <laughs> I actually slightly differ. I'd make a distinction. Liz Cheney is a bona fide conservative. Every vote she cast for those four years, I disagree with her vote in the first impeachment, but she can make a case for that, I suppose. Chris Christie's different. He went and he sucked up every way he could. He tried to get in the administration. He couldn't. He tried to become an advisor. He couldn't. He stayed with him. He advised him during the recount. And only now uh, has he had this epiphany. So I think there's a distinction. I have a lot of I have a lot of respect for Liz Cheney, who's an honest conservative with whom I profoundly disagree. For standing up on principle, I think Chris Christie uh, is an opportunist, and, you know, if you want to welcome him. Well, in the the church of the anti-Trump, I'd put Liz Cheney in the second pew and Chris Christie in the 45th pew. Maybe the balcony. Maybe the balcony. Maybe the balcony. But, you know, if somebody wants to see the error their ways, come overboard. Come overboard. I just don't trust him to go, you know, not to go back, Uh, whereas I do do think she's in it uh, for principle. Anyway... Jim in Bocas del Toro, Panama, says, oh, wow. what do you think about Andrew Yang starting a third party uh, to avoid the spoiler effect? He says we need to have ranked choice voting to help unclog the drain in our polarized system. You know, <clears throat> I have two thoughts. First of all, I go back and forth in ranked choice voting. I need to know more, find out more about it. My initial reaction was that it was a mess in New York. It ended up it worked pretty well, I guess. In the end, so and and it's worked pretty well in Maine. I, I I want to spend more time looking at that, researching that, and thinking about it. I think the idea of a third party. I'm sorry, it's going to go nowhere. It never has. Andrew Yang isn't going to be any different than others who've tried it, except he doesn't have the kind of money that Ross Perot had. Uh, so uh, you know, third parties are tilting at windmills. Uh, rank choice voting. We need to think more about. Well, I I I got a rank choice thing. I I, I hard to embrace that, which I totally. I don't quite understand it. I think I've got to kind of work in fundamental knowledge of it. Uh, and it, you're right, it, it did work. I, it, I think the, the will of the Democrats in New York was served by it. I am not sure that if they would have had a straight primary, it, it would have been much different. But right. uh, there, there'll be a ton of political science on this. Uh, by the way, Panama, I was in Panama City, must have been like two, maybe a little more, two and a half years ago. It, and not the rest of the country is sure it's like anything else, but Panama City is like you're in downtown Denver. I mean, that is a prosperous place. And they have gazillions of high-rise condos, and I think, what, of course, I think it's a lot of really wealthy people from around Latin America is probably, for, I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody, but there's, there's probably some larger money going into high-rises in Panama City, just a guess. Uh, but it's great. To have, I mean, I, I, like, I like Panama a lot. I'd Love to go in the, the canal is just one of the great sights in in the world. And remember, to get from the Atlantic, or I guess more accurately, the Caribbean to the Pacific, you actually have to travel. <clears throat> you travel east. Uh, that, that isthmus of Panama is 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 just a, a, a remarkable place. It really is. I, I love Panama. See, and I actually did a campaign. It didn't work out. I was trying to you know do a second change the term limits to some, some time ago. So I've been around Panama a lot. And, you know, Mariana Rivera might be the best baseball player of my life. Well, two <laughs> things that did work out were David McCullough's great book on the building of that canal. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that worked out was, and give Jimmy Carter and Howard Baker credit, when they adopted the Panama Canal Treaties in the face of really overwhelming public opposition, man, I'll tell you, Panama and a lot of Central America would have been a lot different oh, uh, if, they, if they had screwed that up. So... That was you know. back when Democrats had to do unpopular things. Now we'll, we'll get into this and Paul right. <laughs> asking us to do popular things and we don't right. do it. And that was in, in, in back in the days where some Republicans were statesmen, uh, like Howard Baker, uh, in contrast to Mitch McConnell, uh, we might say. But um, anyway, that was a good question, Jim. We're going to so was. We're going to stay. Uh, we're going to stay international, uh, good. James. I like that. Evan, I like in, Evan in Paris, France, says on the episode. With Joseph Ellis, 
You, James Carville, said that you believe that history was the new theology. As a young history teacher, Evan over in Paris, this resonated with him. Could you explain a little bit more what you meant? And do you see value for historians like myself who are interested in either pivoting towards public policy or political consulting? Well, first of all, I encourage you to look if you want to go to political show, public policy. It's great. I, th- I think your background in history actually can, can, can be quite beneficial. What, what, what history has done, if you just take Reconstruction, all right, you've had, it's just, it's evolved. It evolves over a period of time. And what happens, with, with it, and so you see this particularly on the right, but the founding fathers being, you know, inspired by, you know, the word of God. The, the founding fathers were actually probably the least religious, or I should, uh, church going, um, you know, generation we've ever had running the United States government. That's just a fact, you know. And as, you know, we think we know everything, and history keeps unearthing things and unearthing things. And, you know, we were taught that Grant was a butcher. Of course, now we know that he was no such thing. And a great general. So, it, 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 yes, and, and then everybody uses uses history to validate their own current view. I, I think some people would argue that the 1619 Project was an example of that. I, I don't want to get into the debates over it, but that's cause, and, and that's where one of the things where you can see my point that history is theology, that the passions and the intensity uh, of, of which that evokes re- reminds you of, of, like, religious arguments. So yeah. that, uh, yeah, and I, but I, look, I, I would, and by the way, I'm, I'm coming to Paris pretty soon. Let's have some lunch, dude. All right, Evan, we're ready, and he'll give me advice on political consulting. I would just add to that. Remember, it was George Santayana who said that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, uh, i.e. Vietnam and Afghanistan. So uh, I want to tell you, uh, Jen, uh, you know, you, you really are on to something. And, uh, boy, that's a tough life being a history professor, Evan, over in Paris. Uh, the next question, I'm going to combine two questions here, James. Uh, uh, staying on the international front, we have Ian in Manchester, U.K., and I'm going to follow it up with Lynn in Galveston, Texas. We'll come home. Lynn says, um, uh, I am, Ian, rather, in Manchester, he says, I'm becoming exasperated with Kirsten Sinema's blockade of Biden's infrastructure and social spending bills. Sure, Manchin is acting similarly, but he's made his position clear. Sinema, on the other hand, is as clear as mud as she refuses to engage openly with anyone. Is it possible she intends to block both bills, come hell or high water, and seek Senate re- re-election in 2024 as a Republican? Whereas in a similar vein, Lynn in Galveston, Texas says, please explain to me why Joe Manchin should continue to support coal. Well, on the cinema question, I agree with your analysis, Ian, but as Barney Frank, uh, I think I think cinema just is trying to seek attention uh, in this, and uh, I don't know what kind of a game she'll end up playing. Uh, she is going to have a hard time, as Barney Frank told us in this show a few weeks ago, converting to Republicanism because she is avidly pro-choice and avidly pro-LGBTQ. There's not a lot of room in the Republican Party for that. <clears throat> so I'm not sure <clears throat> what she'll do. Joe Manchin is for Cole in West Virginia because if he wouldn't, he would not be Senator Cole, Joe Manchin. Cole is, for all of its faults, and Lord knows I think we ought to move away from it. In West Virginia right now, there are just too many jobs at stake and it's too important. I give Joe Manchin either credit or a pass on that. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, just, you know, the guy's 73 years old, right? right. He, he's a Roman Catholic Democrat from West Virginia. It just, it, it, he's been a coal guy all of his life. And, you know, right now, you know, they probably can export all they want because if you read the, the it's coming up this winter because of supply questions and the fact that the Russia controls the spigot of natural gas into Western Europe. You go free, might freeze to death. So it's a in, in terms of cinema. I, I, I the ring, and I, I agree. It, the thing about her is she's vexing. No one really knows her. It, it, her behavior seems like not very kind of tied together. And I I suspect it's going to be Manchin and Biden making a deal and saying, send us to cinema, this is what what we're doing. 
and you, you, I, I don't know her, but they literally gonna drag the co whole country down. This brother, they get back in power, you can kiss democracy goodbye. Goodbye. And, and uh, I want to address my our friend over in Sydney. There, there are many things I've seen in my life, and you, you see them and you go, well, that's pretty nice, and I've always wanted to see it, and it's great. That Sydney Harbor is one of these things that just does not disappoint. That at that opera house, I mean, when I, I'd have seen a thousand pictures of it, and it, it's actually more beautiful than you think. It just, it, they, uh, I spent some time in, in, in Sydney, and it, it, it and it's just a great city. So uh, I'm glad y'all out of lockdown there too. Man, we got some great questions from those international listeners today. Uh, staying at home though, Steve in Riverside. Oh, James, this is oh, is this for you? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be fascinated by your answer on this one. Steve from Riverside wants to know why do so many talented black athletes choose to play for Southern State Universities where there's significant racism and voter suppression when they could go to colleges in blue states where there is less of that? Well, first of all, let, let's back this up. All right. Let's take LSU, which you know, 13% of our student body is black. At one time, it might still be the case, the largest historically black university in the country is Southern in Baton Rouge. I, I mean, why would you go to LSU and not go to the University of Iowa? And because, you you know, and, and a lot of their families are there and they want their parents or aunts and extended family members and friends to see them play. And that's asking a lot of a 17, 18-year-old to base, you know, what they're interested in more than anything else is getting to play on Sunday. And, boy, when you play for these big powerhouse teams, you, you get noticed. And you play against other powerhouse teams, you're going to get drafted. So I, I, at, at, at one sense, I, I, I see what prompted the question. But if you think about it a little bit further, it, it's, uh, it, it, that doesn't hold up. And, and the, like the administration at these colleges, I can't tell you the student body, in my experience, is anything but racist. All right, the people, the, the president of the president of LSU is is a black guy. All right, so why would you go to Michigan? I don't know if the president of Michigan State maybe it's a black guy. Yeah, you know, Iowa or something like that. Why wouldn't you feel comfortable at a university where you you have a and it's really good. So I thank you for the question. I'm not. I just wanted to amplify on that a little bit. Well, I think you're right. Um, uh, absolutely right. I do wish that some of these teams would raise that are overwhelmingly black questions about playing bowl games in these states that are engaged in racial voter suppression. Uh, I don't know if it'll happen, but, uh, you know, I still hold out some hope for that. But uh, I think these kids have every right to go to school where they want to go to school, and uh, uh, I agree with you. Doug, in yeah. and, Encinas, and, and, <clears throat> California, asks, are you worried about the $29 trillion national debt? Doug, I'm going to quote Ronald Reagan. It's big enough to take care of itself. So I'm not going to worry a whole lot about it. And I'm also, I love to cite guests on this show as David Wessel, uh, who, by the way, has a great book out and only the rich can play, said several weeks ago on, <clears throat> on this program, it is, we can afford more debt now because of low interest rates. Uh, and at some point, we're going to have to address some of it. But the old conventional wisdom that we can't live with this kind of debt, uh, I think, is out the window. You know, under the woulda, shoulda, coulda, and of course, it would have been no way you can't blame Obama, or blame Rahm Emanuel, or anything like that, because it never paid. But I suppose we'd have just gotten two and a half trillion dollars in debt in 2010, and we and, and rebuilt the infrastructure. We would be probably, probably ten years into it by the time they got it cranked up. But I don't know if these interest rates are going to stay this low forever. But but why it is, we ought to grab all the money that we can, and. Again, my philosophy is this, you know, the people who say, James, you know, who's going to pay for that bridge we're building? I said, my children and grandchildren are going to pay for it. You know why? Because they're going to use it. I'm not going to pay for it. Thing I, you know, so I, I don't, I, I, I agree, it, it, it is a lot of money, but when you're talking about interest rates of this and the needs that the country has are, 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 are so bad, I just, my only regret is we didn't run this debt up. Ten, 10 years ago. And we'd be 10 years into 
having this infrastructure and 10 years into creating all these jobs and everything else. But and we'd have less debt. Gonna happen. If we'd yes, we'd have less debt. Right. Yes. Final, quest, now, final question. Yeah. We're going to stay domestic because we had all those great global questions. This is Joe in Spokane, Washington, uh, the home of the Gonzaga Zags. Uh, he wants to know, where would Walmart be without the U.S. Navy keeping sea lanes open? Where would Amazon be without cheap, regulated, and reliable power? Where would our high-tech community be without the research done through our universities and funded by the government? Of course the rich c should pay more. They consume more. And why are politicians not talking about the value of services the government provides? If Procter & Gamble sold soap the way politicians sell the benefits of government, we'd still be washing our clothes with lies. That's a good point, Joe. You know, Joe, the, the father of progressive taxation is actually none other than Adam Smith, who said that the rich should pay a higher proportion of income because they have more to protect. So if, if you have, you have more to protect, you know, to put, if you live in an expensive house, if police protect you, you have more to lose than if you live in a, in, in a more modest dwelling. And so I, I completely agree, but, you know, when we keep, when the shipping lanes are open, and the Navy does a good job, and they're, they're, they're really extended. It, it just doesn't benefit Amazon or Walmart. It benefits consumers. <laughs> I mean, how'd you like to, you know, now we're seeing with this container backup, you know, people are going to be wanting things that they can't get. So it, it, it's a good question. And whenever, you, you know, some goofy right-winger starts complaining about taxes on rich people, just pull out old Adam Smith, the, considered to be the founder of modern capitalism. It's a great question, Joe, and I would just add to it also, you know where the Internet started. You know the origins of the Internet? It was DARPA. It was the federal government. Uh, so it's, sure. a, point, it's a point that ought to be made more. But thank the you. human genome keep, project. Keep those questions coming, and I apologize for not getting to some of them. If Dan Max wouldn't send us so damn many good questions, uh, we'd have an easier time. But, boy, we love them. So please write in again. All right, now for the outrage of the week. You know something? Uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito always has been mean-spirited. Now he's inexplicably angry. Inexplicably, I say, because due to legal cheating, uh, his right wing has a majority in the high court. So what are you so damn mad about, Justice Alito? At a speech at Notre Dame, he lashed out at court critics, especially the press and the Atlantic's respected writer uh, and uh, Adam Sewer. Uh, here's the irony. He lashes out for the bad coverage, but while complaining about it, he bars any transcription or any broadcasting of his broadsides. So, Sam, what do you have? I'm sorry, I should call you Mr. Justice. Mr. Justice, what do you have against transparency, and why are you so angry? All right. Well, I have, but I, I challenge our readers to come up with anything stupider than this, okay? I, I'm taking a Carvillian arrogance thing. This is the stupidest goddamn thing I've ever heard in my life, and I'm going to read from a site called Raw Story, which actually is pretty good, and they, they link a lot. They're, they're certainly a left-of-center site, but they find interesting stuff, and, and they link to their sources. Now, listen very carefully, because I'm going to read directly from this article. A Republican state legislative candidate in Virginia posed an interesting question on Twitter recently. I'm curious, do you think the sea level would lower if we just took all the boats out of the water? Just a thought, not a <laughs> statement, wrote Scott Pio, who is challenging Democrat delegate David Reed in Loudoun County's District 32. Pio subsequently deleted the tweet, but not before it was picked up by the Virginia group Blue Virginia. P.O. later wrote, but wait a minute, this man is an intellectual of the first order. I want to show you how smart this guy is. In response to Blue Virginia's post, when you take things out of the bathwater, the bathwater decreases, does it not? I got a lot of hate mail from your group asking the question about taking things out of the water. Curious, when you stop believing in pure physics, I guess you don't believe in science experiments. Now, that goes all the way back to Archimedes, right? This guy... Think about this. Let's just take all the boats out the water because every time you get out of the bathtub, the water rises. It this passes as a thoughtful intellectual in modern conservatism. I, I, 
Beat, beat Jane. Find something stupider than this. <laughs> That's a great contest for everybody yeah, out there because it's a, it is a, it is a, it is a <laughs> depending on your point of view, a high or a low bar indeed. And I like okay. the fact that he doubled we're, we're, down on it. We're waiting to hear from you. Okay. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email. So politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. We'll get to as many as we can, and please tell us where you're from. Following this episode, we would really appreciate it if you check out the link to our sponsor, Blinkist, in the show notes. We deeply thank you for supporting them when you do. It helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us... Subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our War Room planning.